encourager. Essential. I think the word I would use is impactful. We are so impactful as far as, you know, our students, the impact that we have on them, and also um, on the patient population because us sharing our knowledge and cultivating and, and developing, you know, uh, and creating those safe and effective nurses can really have an impact on the care that patients receive. And because of that, that also has an impact on the entire profession in general. So one word to describe the nurse educator, we have a very, very huge impact on the art and science of nursing. A connector. Influencer. Indispensable. The one word that I would use to describe a nurse educator is champion. Champion that coaches students to be their best. And the favorite part of being a nurse educator is watching the amazing things that our students will achieve in their career. They go on to be nurses who pursue advanced degrees, certifications, and assume roles that impact patients and communities, not just locally, but globally. And I am so proud to be a nurse educator and a nurse champion for the future generation. Welcome to the 2022 opening session and keynote speaker. Please welcome National League for Nursing Chair, Dr. Kathleen Poindexter. The music was a little short to do the entrance dance, but on behalf of the Board of Governors and staff of the National League for Nursing, Welcome to the 2022 National League for Nursing Education Summit here in wonderful Las Vegas. I am pleased to announce that we have over 1,240 plus attendees <laughs> with us. Isn't that amazing? Over double the number that we had last year. You are here at an important junction in not just our nation's history, but our planet's history. As you know, our summit theme is healthy planet, healthy people, leading the way through education, practice, and policy. And as nurse educators and leaders, you have an important role to play in addressing the impact of climate change on the nursing students we educate and the patients we serve. Climate change represents an existential threat that requires sustained, strategic, and systemic action to mitigate. I agree. <laughs> to mitigate the long-term devastation it inflicts on communities, families, and individuals. Nurse educators and partner organizations can help to address the ongoing challenges and effects of climate change on health, advocate for a sustainable environment, and advance health equity in nursing education. We thank you all for joining the NLN in getting the word out that the health of our planet is absolutely vital to the health of our people. Thank you.
We are here this year not just at a time of challenge, but also a time of celebration. As you know, the NLN declared 2022 as the year of the nurse educator. I don't think that's ever been done before. Today, we celebrate the vital role of nurse educators in making it possible for nurses to deliver everything from life-saving emergency services to end-of-life care. Nursing education is the foundation and the development of our professional workforce, regardless of the degree or area of specialization. It all starts with education. Your commitment to go above and beyond ensures that the next generation of nurses, some of whom began working on the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic, can provide safe, high quality nursing care with professional competence and confidence. Throughout the year, the NLN has been highlighting the experience of nurse educators when teaching in a variety of academic and clinical settings. Here is what some of you had to say when you were asked to share your stories of being a nurse educator. Being a nurse educator to me means being flexible and adaptable to meet the needs of my learners, but it also to me means expanding my scope of influence by working with nurse leaders and inspiring them and playing a role by giving them tools and skills that they will need in practice to uh, lead other nurses as well as making a difference to patients. Nurses really have such a central role and really with the complexity of patients, it is so important to have excellence in terms of our role modeling to our students, to have excellence in that role modeling and to see that role as being crucial and critical to the recovery of the patient so that patients can actually reach their optimal status. I remain motivated every day um, after all of these years um, because I know that what I do makes a difference. Um, sometimes you don't necessarily hear that from students every day, but when you do, it's extremely rewarding. Extremely rewarding. As an educator, I use my skills and talents to inspire and transform the lives of my students. My students in turn change and empower their families, their patients, and their communities. Why do I like being a nurse educator? For me, it's simple. I love giving back to the next generation of nurses and teaching them in the clinical arena all the things that I wish that I would have learned when I was in nursing school. I think of my patients over the years as charms in my Pandora bracelet. And every experience that I've had as an educator has transformed my heart and made me a better human being. And I think that is the blessing of being an educator, is that long after we're gone, things will be somewhat different because we were here. Share those feelings. I bet everybody here has done that. You can find more of these videos along with a variety of content and downloadable material to showcase the significance of your nurse educator role at yearofthenurseeducators.org. This was an informational statement. Now on for the commercial break. You will also find a gift store on the website where you can purchase nurse educator theme shirts and gifts. Proceeds support the incredible incredible important work of the NLN Foundation for Education. So once again, a sincere thank you for your support and your hard work. <laughs> Next, I am pleased to recognize the members of the NLN Board of Governors. Their insights and wisdom are truly beyond estimation. And I cannot say it enough, it's a privilege to work with these outstanding leaders. I'm so thankful for my colleagues. This time I also wanna recognize their home organizations and the members that support their work with the NLN. 
We couldn't do it without you. So all of you, please stand as I call your names. First, NLN Cherilet, Patricia Sharpneck, Green School of Nursing and Health Professions, Ursuline College. <laughs> Secretary Cheryl Killian, Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing, and she sends her apologies, she could not join us this week. Our treasurer, who's really important, Ann Krause from Widener University School of Nursing. <laughs> Audrey Bouvet, Egan School of Nursing and Health Studies, Fairfield University. And she too sent her apologies. She had an injury and could not join us. Walter Bumpus, American Association of Community Colleges, and again, sent his apologies for a conflicting date. Mahida Albana, George Washington University School of Nursing. <laughs> Mark Ann, East Carolina University College of Nursing. <laughs> Cheryl Hoying, Kirby Bates. Michael Newsom, Research Virginia Commonwealth University School of Nursing. <laughs> Yolanda Van Riel, North Carolina Central University. <laughs> and Mark Boak, Galen College of Nursing. And I also have to recognize my organization, Michigan State College of Nursing. <laughs> uh, they keep us on the straight and narrow, all of us. I know that with all the amount of work and energy and effort that everybody shares with the NLN, it really does take the support of your home organization. So thank you. Now I am going to turn it over to our esteemed president and CEO to recognize some of our valued supporters who are making this year's summit possible. Please join in me in a warm welcome for Dr. Beverly Malone. Thank you so very much for joining us this year. We're really excited to have such a large crowd with us again. You, you actually look beautiful, but don't tell anyone. We owe, them a, we owe all of you a big thank you, and especially our sponsors. We could not have done it without this year's sponsors. Please wait until we have acknowledged all of our sponsors before you applause. And I know it's going to be hard because they're wonderful folks. We first thank Chamberlain University for being our platinum partner for this year's summit. We next thank Lairdall Medical and Western Governors University College of Health Professions for being our 2022 diamond sponsors. At our gold level, the AARP Foundation is sponsoring a special breakfast for LPNs and LVN educators on Friday morning. Duquesne University School of Nursing is once again supporting the summit at the silver level. And we have three excellent bronze sponsors. Thank you to F.A. Davis, Portage Learning, and Lecturio. Finally, a warm acknowledgement to our summit supporters, Indiana University, UNC Greensboro, and Advancing Health Professionals. Thank you all for your support of the annual summit and of the NLN. Please let's have a big round of applause for our sponsors. <laughs> Next, on behalf of the NLN's Foundation for Nursing Education and Chair Patrick Robinson, we extend our deepest thanks, as we always do, to all those who have contributed to the foundation throughout the year. Special thanks to the NLN Foundation Advisory Council, which includes Kate Campbell of TrueLearn, 
Sharon Cox of Chamberlain University, Robbie Craven of F.A. Davis, Alf Christian Diebdahl of Lairdall Medical, Cole Edmondson of AMN Healthcare, Tim Iman of Healthcare Learning Alliance, Elaine Foster of Ed Education Affiliates, Ranil Harris of Emeritus Healthcare, Emeritus Healthcare, Mary Jo Jerdy of United Health Group, Rhonda Laws of Lecturio, Andrew Lingo of Health Carousel, Nick Mansour of Arizona College of Allied Health, James Quick of Simplify, Joan Rich of Rasmussen University, Paxton Ritter of De I Design, Mikael Snyder of Nightingale College, Janet Smith Hill of SSM Health, David Theobald of Davin Healthcare, Ward Almer of West Coast University, Mark Voigt of Galen College of, Uni of Nursing, A Abdel Youssef of Unitec, and myself, Bev Malone of the National League for Nursing. Plus we have two anonymous members and I have tried to convince them to reveal, but no, no, no. We have two anonymous members, so we want to invite anyone else who needs anonymity, we can take care of you. So just let us know. Not to mention the 2022 NLN Academy class and the 2022 NLN Centers of Excellence and all benefactors of the NLN Foundation Summit on that thank you all out there. Please check it out in the lobby. It's something you must have your name on. So if you haven't made that donation yet and you really want to get your name on it, just make the right amount. We'll figure out how to do it. We will take care of you. Uh, we would like to thank all of our generous partners and sponsors. We thank you so much. Could, could all of those who were named just please stand so we can acknowledge you, please? NLN and Chamberlain University, and this is, these are the initiatives that we have. We have some incredible partners. And with Chamberlain University, the College of Nursing Center for the Advancement of the Science of Nursing Education. Talk about year of the nurse educator. This is the essence of it. Dr. Karen Cox, president. NLN Walden University of Nursing Institute for Social Determinants of Health and Social Change. All of the following are associated with Walden University. Dr. Sue Subak, Chief Academic Officer. Dr. Andrea, Andrea Lindell, Vice Provost, College of Health Professions, and Vice Provost and Dean for the College of Nursing. And I have to admit, she was also my Dean in another lifetime. Advancing, and Tom O'Shea, Vice President, Strategic Alliance. So these are all the colleagues associated with Walden. Advancing historically black colleges and university schools of nursing through technology, teaching excellence and communities of practice, Elsevier Foundation and Elon Shim, who is the director. NLN J and J Project. Transitioning senior nursing students in historically black colleges and universities, schools of nursing, into clinical practice. The Johnson & Johnson Foundation in partnership with the J&J Center for Health Worker Innovation. Julie Cornell is the senior manager and she is absolutely fantastic. Johnson & Johnson, Global Community Impact, NLN Leadership Institute, Galen College, Galen College of Nursing, Mark Voigt, CEO. Taking AIM series, it's another initiative on structural racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion. AMN Healthcare, Dr. Cole Edmondson, Chief Experience and Clinical Officer. Elsevier Education and Health, Dr. Kevon Holloway, Managing Director. Global Education, Reference and Continuity, Health Markets, and Amanda Leader, Senior Vice President, Sales, Nursing and Health Education. 
Another initiative is ACE, plus advancing care excellence for the LGBTQ plus community through nursing education. Sarah Mishirov, Director of Strategy and Operations, and George B. Irish, Eastern Director, the Hearst Foundation. Jonas Scholars, Jonas Philanthropies, Donald and Barbara Jonas. I, I must add personally, uh, we will miss this extraordinary couple. Donald, yes, they, Donald died this year. Their gifts to nursing and veterans have inspired and supported nurses throughout the nation. We greatly appreciate their support for the NLN and for their continued commit, commitment to making a difference. Please celebrate all of these initiatives, <laughs> which are amazing, and their contributions that the sponsors have shared with the NLN and with you, therefore. Please, colleagues, join me in giving them all a round of applause. And one of my colleagues, who I don't think has been here before, joined us, and I just want to mention Dr. Frank Gerbasi, who is the CEO of the Council on Accreditation of Nurse Anesthesia Educational Programs, and he is actually here in the house this year. Frank, are you in the house? Can you please stand so you can be acknowledged? If he's not, tell him when you see him, say, Bev Malone was looking for you. <laughs> and tell him how happy we are to see him. Finally, I would like to thank everyone who is considering it as well as those who will make a donation to the Ellen Foundation during the summit. You can find ways to give online through the summit app. I know you all will join me in thanking these donors for their generosity and support. Let me now turn this back over into the capable hands of the NLN Chair, Kathleen. Thank you, Bev. And as you can see, it really does take an international global village to make all of this happen and move our profession forward. I would also like to thank the many people who generously give of their time and talent to support the goals and mission of the National League for Nursing. Thank you all. Okay. A year ago, I invited our nurse leaders and academic colleagues to partner with the NLN and engage in futuristic thinking to reimagine, redesign, and re-engineer viable solutions to address acute and long-standing systemic problems that plague not only our profession, but the health of our nation and global communities. To commit to taking bold action to address health equity, address systemic racism, promote a diverse workforce, an inclusive environment in which to work and live, and to support the overall mental health and well-being for ourselves and our colleagues in both academics and in practice. Lessons learned over the past two years have been painful, but yet they've been valuable. The broad reach made visible the inequities in our healthcare system and provided us with some transformational opportunities deemed essential to advancing the future of nursing education, practice, and regulation. But change, and I mean real change, requires the collective actions of a cohesive profession committed to shared vision to create our preferred future for nursing. In the words of Albert Einstein, we cannot solve, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. One of our greatest challenges we face as nurse leaders and educators is the rapid pace of change. The ability to adapt and respond quickly requires agile and responsive leaders and educators 
who can align stakeholders to envision and shape a preferred future through collective action. They support a safe environment that encourages risk taking. They permit new solutions and innovations in response to problems and the courage to pivot when our outcomes are not as anticipated. They recognize and celebrate even the small successes. As educators, these are the attributes we hope to instill in our students. The future of our profession, the future of healthcare, it requires a diverse nursing workforce that has, the, again, the confidence and the competence to respond to the new healthcare challenges that face us every day. Nurse educators must keep pace with the priority demands of healthcare and transform our teaching in a way that will prepare agile students with knowledge, skills, and accountability for continued growth. We must ensure graduate nurses are competent in the delivery of safe, quality, person-centered care and that they advance population health to promote healthier communities. Great nurse educators influence, inspire, motivate, and lead confident, visionary, future change makers. The National League for Nursing is the leader to promote excellence in nursing education. As noted in the NLN mission statement, we are dedicated to building a strong and diverse workforce to advance the health of our nation and global community. Our mission is guided by four core values, caring, integrity, diversity, and inclusion, and excellence. I've had the honor and the privilege of observing those core values being carried out in the work of the NLN through their tremendous accomplishments and visionary leadership under the direction of pr our president and CEO, Dr. Beverly Malone. This past year, the NLN has taken a leading role in addressing environmental health, decarbonization, and impact on overall well being with the launch of our two new resource centers. One, the Climate Resource Center at NLN.org offers members access to resources and events focused on the impact of climate change. Nurses and educators are called on to help mitigate the health threats posed by the ongoing effects of climate change. It's not difficult to see the impact of catastrophic events that are occurring, such as floods, hurricanes, fires, extreme temperatures. Simply turn on the news or look at the headlines. But what may not be as obvious is the global impact on food sources crop devastation, access to clean drinking water, poor air quality that threatens our food sources and contributes to housing insecurity, increase in chronic diseases, and decrease in access to health care and employment, all of which disproportionately impacts our most vulnerable populations. As nurses and as educators, it's our responsibility to upgrade 2.0, I think we're at 4.0 now, our curriculum to reflect the growing threats to the overall health of our nation and our global community to better prepare our graduates for the realities of the practice that they're going to enter. The nurses and nurse educators well-being resource center also at NLN.org provides resources to mitigate the burnout and threats to the mental health of nurses and educators nationwide. We know the health of our nation depends on healthy and vibrant nurses and educators, and we must provide our students with the tools to be able to address it once they move into practice. The NLN has a strong commitment to promoting health equity and social justice. The NLN and Walden University College of Nursing opened an Institute for Social Determinants of Health and Social Change to develop future leaders who can address the impact of structural racism and inequalities to promote the health and well being. When events occur, or situations that threaten the health and safety of our nation, the NLN was poised to release some timely position statements. In response to the nursing shortage, and many of you may have read these, well, we hope you did, um, 
the NLN value statement on workforce demands of the future, the educational imperative was published listing planned action steps to support nursing education and called on Congress for further support to avert a national health crisis. The NLN also took a stand on promoting a just culture approach with healthcare errors in response to criminalizing medical errors that threatened honest reporting, further jeopardizing the health outcomes of all nurses. In addition, the NLN has called for action by decrying census gun violence, urging increased efforts to combat a rising public health crisis. The NLN, the leader in nursing education, is well positioned to lead the advancement of nursing education and assessment, leadership development, research, simulation, and preparation of certified advanced practice nurse educators. Our post-pandemic response to how we reorganize the new realities of healthcare, nursing, and the preparation of our future workforce requires a transformative perspective to break down barriers, challenge some long-held assumptions, and be a force for positive disruption. Nursing education and nurse educators are responsible for the development of every nurse regardless of their degree or specialization. The future of the nursing workforce is dependent on the dedicated efforts and work of qualified nurse educators. It will take all of us to work together to make a real impactful change. But none of us has to do this alone. We, all of us, are the NLN, and we are. <laughs> and I hope everyone at this summit finds new ideas and inspirations because whatever happens in Vegas had better not stay in Vegas. <laughs> I want you to keep the momentum strong. I want you to return home as a positive force to influence all that impactful change. Educational excellence is the foundation that serves to establish the future nursing workforce, the quality of care delivered, and the health of our communities nationally and globally. Thank you. Colleagues, please join me in a round of applause for our NLN Chair, Kathleen Port Dexter. <laughs> I have an opportunity to own the stage right now, something I've always wanted to do. I would like to invite some very special people on stage. Deb Steve and Carol Vermish from Michigan State University College of Nursing. I think this is too loud. <laughs> too loud. Um, that was not expected. <laughs> that was far from unexpected. Carol? To say we're thankful for Dr. Poindexter's leadership at Michigan State University College of Nursing is an understatement. We are so lucky and we want to honor and thank Dr. Poindexter for her leadership via the NLN as well as at Michigan State University College of Nursing. And we are proud to call her NLN chair as well as a Spartan nurse. Thank you for all you do. so much for that wonderful surprise. Carol, you're a wonderful speech guy. <laughs> and I 
still have the mic. <laughs> now then, as we normally do, we have not one, but two NLN President Award winners this year. The NLN President's Award recognizes leaders in healthcare who are shining examples of the NLN core values of excellence, integrity, caring, and diversity. These individuals have dedicated their lives work to advancing the health of the nation and the global community. Now, I have the pleasure of introducing the first recipient of this year's President Award on behalf of the NLN. Our first President's Award honoree is Dr. Jan Joan Shank. Dr. Joan Shank is Executive Dean Emerita of the College of Health Professions at Western Governors University in Salt Lake City, Utah, who recently retired as Senior Vice President, but those of us that work in nursing academics know nobody ever really retires, <laughs> and Executive Dean after 14 years in positions of leadership, a national expert on competency-based education and the science of learning Dr. Joan Shank had more than 95,000 graduates of Western Governors University complete their degrees during her tenure leading the College of Health Professions. Now that's impressive. She designed and launched the school's first competency-based pre-licensure BNSEN program and led graduate and undergraduate health profession programs in nursing and other health professions to facilitate increased access to educational opportunities for rural communities. She pioneered the use of virtual reality assessments of students enrolled in these programs. Dr. Joan Shank also led the development of nursing graduate programs for family nurse practitioners and psychiatric nurse practitioners. Both nursing programs have twice been recognized as NLN Centers of Excellence in Nursing Education, most recently in 2021. Dr. Joan Shank holds a master's degree in nursing administration and is a board certified nurse administrator. She earned her doctorate in health sciences with an emphasis in global health. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jan Joan Shank. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, thanks to the NLN, um, Bev, and all the leaders. And I'm so happy to see some of you. You look much better than you did on Zoom. Um, <laughs> it's nice to see you in person. Uh, I am remain very flabbergasted to receive this award. I didn't uh, ever expect this to happen in my career, in my lifetime. but. I have many great nursing education and nursing leader and nursing practice, uh, friends and colleagues to thank for all they did to form me through my life, um, challenge me, make me better, lift me up, and really what's better than a, an involved and engaged uh, group of peer community. Uh, nothing is better than that. I also want to thank Western Governors University for giving me the opportunity to be innovative, to take risks, uh, to give me a home, a safe base, uh, during a time when my work, early work on competency-based education was met with some skepticism, frankly. Um, but I always had 
the support of Western Governors University to do some of the unusual things uh, that we tried, and not all of them worked, um, but that's the price you pay for innovation. Finally, but foremost, I wanna thank my family. My husband and daughter and son are here tonight with me, and uh, they've always been a tremendous support for me in whatever I needed to do, and often I was away and they thrived in spite of it. So I'm really delighted to have them with me tonight and I'm delighted to receive this award. Thank you. We're very good stewards of your membership dues. <laughs> Again, on behalf of the NLN board and the entire NLN family of nursing educators and leaders, I wish you our heartfelt congratulations. <laughs> our second president's award honoree just also happens to be our keynote speaker tonight, Dr. Barbara Sattler. She is, an <laughs> yes. she is an international leader in environmental health and nursing. Dr. Sattler is a professor emeritus in the School of Nursing and Health Professions at the University of San Francisco. She is also a founding and current board member of the Alliance for Nurses for Healthy Environments an organization that is helping to integrate environmental health, including climate change, into nursing education, practice, research, and policy, and advocacy. She has been an advisor to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's Office of Child Health Protection and the National Library for Medicine for Informational Needs of Health Professionals on Environmental Health. She's been the principal investigator on a host of grants from Health Resources Service Administration, the National Institute of Environmental Health Science, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Supported by the grants uh, from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, she helped to bring local sustainable healthy foods to Maryland's hospitals. She is the author of Environmental Health and Nursing, and many other peer-reviewed articles. Dr. Sattler is a registered nurse with a master's in public health and a doctor's in public health from John Hopkins School of Public Health. She's a fellow in the American Academy of Nursing. Please join me in congratulating Dr. Barbara Sattler. Thank you so much, and I am so appreciative of this honor. Um, nursing's a team sport, isn't it? And uh, environmental health has been a team sport too. I'm gonna get to talk to you quite a bit about environmental health and a little bit about climate change, but I'd like to just share with you what that when I first started, by the way, I, um, I was at the first Earth Day and helped to organize the California first Earth Day, so that's a long time ago. <laughs> and that was my inception. That was in 1970, so we organized in 1969, and oh, was that a great time for organizing. That was the beginning of the modern day environmentalist movement. But when I first started working on environmental health and nursing, I was often either the only nurse in a room of environmentalists or the only environmentalist in a room of nurses. And now I'm really happy to know how many of you consider yourself environmentalists and nurses? A few hands. And maybe after I speak with you during the plenary, a few more hands will go up. Thank you so much for the honor, I really appreciate it.
And again, on behalf of the NLN board and the entire NLN family, please uh, join me in congratulating Barbara. <laughs> now, it is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker. And you may have met her. She has been a very recent NLN President Award winner who needs no further introduction. <laughs> Please welcome Dr. Barbara Sattler. Thank you so much. And if uh, somewhere here, I can have my slides so I can see them. Thank you, perfect. I appreciate that. So I'm going to start with a very quick primer on climate change because it's been my discovery that a lot of nurses are not comfortable in telling people what climate change is. And so I'd like to start very briefly with the fact that we have lived with the sun warming our planet for the millennia. And that heat that has heated the planet, also a large amount of it reflected out and went out beyond the atmosphere. But what we have had happening is that in the last 100 years or so, we've been producing gases that have been blanketing the earth. And what that means, as the sun continues to warm the atmosphere, it, this blanket prevents the heat from reflecting completely out. So we are warming. It's very much akin to when you leave your car in a parking lot and it's a hot day and you come back into that car after you've gone shopping and you're like, whoa, is it hot in here, right? Anybody ever experienced that? That's car warming. Well, what we have going on on Earth right now is global warming and it's the same effect. They call it greenhouse gases because it is surrounding our Earth with these gases that are preventing all of the heat that otherwise would have dissipated into the atmosphere, beyond the atmosphere, it's keeping it close. We were calling it global warming. There was some politicking around that language. We are now calling it climate change. There's still a little politicking around that language, but this is what we're experiencing. You all know that if we get a fever, if we go from normal, about 98.6, to even 100.4, we start to feel lousy. If we get another degree higher, we start to feel even worse, and another degree higher, our organ systems begin to get damaged. And if we are sustained at a higher temperature, we eventually will die, we cannot survive, and that's just a few degrees. So what happens if the whole Earth has a fever? What happens if we begin to watch this Earth, which has depended on a same temperature for all of its flora and fauna, or at least a range of temperature for the millennium, what happens when those temperatures rise? And many living things on Earth will not flourish, and some will die. And that is what's happening with climate change right now. We also have a whole set of underlying diseases on Earth. Between 1970, the first Earth Day, and 2010, we have lost 50% of the globe's biodiversity. 50%. It's a huge loss. We also know that our, globally our air pollution is worsening, and the main culprit, though not the only culprit, is fossil fuels. We know what is causing climate change. We know what is causing these greenhouse gases. We also know that the lungs of the Earth, which are in our forests, but particularly in our tropical forests, are being burned and torn down in order to produce different kinds of crops that will feed beef cattle, as well as being used for grazing. But these forests produce 28% of the world's oxygen. We know that the oceans are in many areas becoming dead zones. The plankton in the oceans are an important part of the life that produces oxygen. 
70% of the world's oxygen is produced by plankton. We need 21% oxygen to be happy campers on Earth. What happens when we have dissipated our ability to produce oxygen on Earth? That's part of climate change. So this slide I created 18 years ago for pre my first presentation on climate change, 18 years ago, for the American Public Health Association. It, we knew then, the scientists knew then, we were going to see increased sea levels, increased extreme storm events, critical changes in agriculture and food security, droughts, fires, heat waves, um, variability in our access to water, increases in morbidity and mortality associated with these climate changes, species extinction, and then climate change refugees. We are in it. We are steeped right now in the middle of climate change. So we also know that we're in a poly crisis. Climate change is not the only crisis that we're experiencing. We know that we had COVID globally in the past few years and continue to have it. We have overpopulation, which is draining the abilities of many parts of the world to give basic life support to humans. Extreme poverty, hunger, wars, homelessness, racial injustices, and then special vulnerabilities of not just the children and the elderly through climate change and other things, but also many other populations that we know will be highly impacted by these kinds of changes and these events. So as Beverly Malone and Catherine and others have mentioned earlier, social determinants of health, we know that they are making people unhealthy. We know racism has huge implications. Did you know that loneliness now causes as much cardiovascular disease and other chronic illnesses as smoking does? Talk about that in a, just a second. And we also are experiencing a sick, sick planet, which I'll talk about. This is being referred to by a new word called the polycrisis. We have systems problems that are going to require systems, plural, systems solutions. Vivek Murthy, the um, Surgeon General, um, he was originally the Surgeon General under Obama. He was interested in what was going on in the social determinants, but in his inquiry about that, he discovered that many, many Americans are lonely. And the experience of loneliness impacts their health in a very significant way. And this is part of the poly crisis. So we also, part of our poly crisis, we have a healthcare system that's broken. We have a business model that rewards hospitals when people are sick and they make no money when people are healthy. How can we have a system with that kind of economic reward that's going to work to keep people healthy? Where's the incentive? A couple of other things, and I am going to mostly go back to climate change in a second. But our healthcare system, first of all, is not about health, it's about sickness. Seldom enough time for us to care. And it's not a system. It's a bunch of little things and some big things. 90% of the Americans right now say that our health care system is broken. And that's by a survey that was done by the AFL-CIO. Our system costs more than two times any other system that's in the industrialized world. 10% of the deaths in the United States are related to medical errors. Prescriptions are the third leading cause of death in the United States. Every 30 seconds, Americans, an American files for medical bankruptcy in the United States. We are suffering also a, an epidemic of chronic diseases. Our system is broke and we are broken. We have got to rally around the poly crisis right now. We cannot have healthy people on a sick planet. That's for sure. This is from today. The little news there was from three hours ago. 
The picture on the bottom left was from Cuba. The picture on the right is from Puerto Rico. And today we'll start seeing more pictures that are going to be from Florida. This is an extreme weather event that is happening literally right now. We are in it. We are in it. We also know I come from Northern California. We're seeing fires of greater frequency, duration, and heat. I've been evacuated twice. Um, I participated in, in some of the evacuation assistance. If you look at the middle top picture, that is a bunch of nurses and others that are trying to evacuate an ICU patient at a Kaiser Hospital with a wall of fire behind them. This happened to other hospitals as well. And this is, um, this is something that these nurses absolutely know we're in. So I ask a question for any of you that are from the western part of the country or other places where you've been experiencing these fires. What air pollution is created when a whole house burns down? The plastics that are in it, the metals, the pesticides, the solvents, the paints. This smoke that's created that blankets the whole West when these giant fires go on, this smoke does not go to heaven. This smoke stays in the air and then it comes down to the ground and it becomes part of our soot and the dust that, and our household dust. So we are just now into a whole variety of sort of new eras of understanding what kinds of exposures, environmental exposures people are going to be having. The other thing that happens, and I was interviewed this morning um, by a reporter in Florida to talk about health effects associated with extreme weather events. And I told her, you know, I'm so glad you're reporting this. This is terrific. But are you going to come back next week and the week after and next year to talk about how when people return to the destruction, how we forget about them? how in order for them to then get their home back in order is going to take a year or two years or more sometimes, how in the interim their children may have to go to a different school, how they've lost everything, how if they were a renter, they don't get their things replaced in the same way that an owner might because of the way our insurance system is set up, how that is a, a race and class situation. We don't talk about that in the news. We like to follow the hurricanes and the floods and the fires. We don't follow the aftermath. As nurses, we have to, and we have to worry about that. And the post-traumatic stress syndrome that we see in people who have experienced these great events. So good climate change policy comes with a wide range of co-benefits for health. Independence from fossil fuels is going to clean our air up. Increased public transportation and separating our reliance from everyone having their own car creates active transportation, which decreases cardiovascular disease, increases our health in a variety of ways, decreases obesity. More sustainable agricultural practice with less pesticides is going to be mean that we'll have less reproductive health problems less heart cancer, and other things that we know are associated with pesticides, and more plant-forward diets, which can help contribute to climate, cli healthy climates, will improve health. All of these together will help contribute to less chronic diseases. Chronic disease is an epidemic in this country. So the co-benefits of us working on climate policies are really important. There are whole new programs right now in nursing innovation. I, I'm all for innovation. But innovation is a tiny little bit like, you know, rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. If our healthcare system isn't working at a whole, taking the incremental steps to innovate is going to make little tiny pecks at the bigger problem. I propose that we be revolutionary not just innovative. I propose that we radically change the healthcare system and that we have it focus on keeping Americans healthy and keeping the planet healthy. Today, President Biden is hosting a 
White House meeting on hunger. He would like to, in the next eight years, end hun hunger in the United States. We're going to wait to hear. Apparently, there are 800 plus different things that they're proposing to do. I'm really excited to hear what this is going to be. But it's these kinds of commitments from on top and then good implementation with, with the necessary budgets at the grassroots level that are going to let us begin to work on this. We need to organize our voices. We need, we have untapped power, untapped power. And I know, because I say it too to many people, nurses are the most trusted voices um, on health issues. I'm almost, almost tired of hearing it. Because you know why? If we're not using them, if I'm not hearing them, if we are not loud and organized in our voices, who cares if we are the most trusted voices? So this is my pie chart, totally made up, no data. I own it, no data. But what percent of nursing curriculum do we spend on teaching our nurses on how to keep people healthy versus how to take care of them when they're sick? What percent of our curriculum do we talk about the healthcare system and its brokenness? And imagine, that word was used before, imagine what a better system would look like. And what percent of our curriculum do we teach the skills necessary for making change? Because there's a skill set in the same way starting a Foley or doing any of the things that we do in nursing, there's a skill set for, for making change. And that needs to grow in this pie chart of mine. The other thing is if you think some other nurse outside of this room will be an awful, an awesome rather, not awful, an awesome advocate um, and system changer, then I'd like you to think again, because you really are the people we are waiting for. We are here. We are the start of the revolution, here. And I think we have the skill set, and if we don't, we know how to get the ones that are missing in our toolbox. So we need a revolutionary culture shift less consumerism, more community, less internet connection, more real connection, less car, more active transport, less isolation, more engagement. In the things that I've learned about isolation and loneliness, we used to have lots of bowling alleys, we had lots of ice skating rinks, we had lots of ways that in our communities, people met and greeted and hung out and drank beer and talk to each other and cried in their beer to each other. And we don't have as many of those kinds of places anymore. People are isolated. Less built environment, more time in nature. Nature is a huge, great healer. And guess what? It's really important, more fun and joy. And I am often the doom and gloom woman in the room. But I am learning that if you want to party with others, you've got to have joy You've got to have music and dance, and, um, and that's going to have them come to your party. And I want to share a party that I go to on Tuesday nights in Santa Rosa, California. It's called the Santa Rosa Taco Tuesday Ride. It was organized by young Latinos, and every Tuesday they get on their bikes. They've invited us, us white people in, and we go in our varying degrees of shapedness. And we ride our bikes for an hour, and then we get to the taco trucks. <laughs> and then we eat tacos that have fresh avocado and fresh tomatoes and beans and rice. But we've ridden for an hour, so we feel like we can have a little sour cream on it. <laughs> we can also be promoting community and involve our students and ourselves in community gardens, block parties, concerts, farmers markets, book clubs, ways of joining. My students don't do potluck dinners. Any of you remember potluck dinners? 
Yeah, well, we introduced them to your students. <laughs> so we need to think globally and act, think globally and act at home, in our homes, locally, institutionally, nationally, regionally, and globally. And I'd like to just, I'm not sure I can read it from here, I hope I can. I wanna just share, this is a bit of a poem that was written by a, a fellow I know in Northern California. Eight weeks ago, I became a grandma for the first time. <laughs> and so, here is the poem. It's 3.23 in the morning, and I'm awake because my great-great-grandchildren won't let me sleep. My great-great-grandchildren. <laughs> Grandmother here <laughs> asked me in her dreams, what did you do while the planet was plundered? What did you do when the earth was unraveling? Surely you did something when the seasons started failing, as the mammals, reptiles, birds were all dying. Did you fill the streets with protest when democracy was stolen? What did you do once you knew? What did you do once you knew? Barbara, you demand so much of us. You are unrelentingly aggressive. <laughs> and the wisdom and generosity of your spirit, I always call it like pouring hot coals of kindness on my head. <laughs> that you just tell the truth too well and you challenge all of us, not just us here, but those we go home to, to say what will we do? And what were we doing? And how did we know what was going on and not do? So I thank you. It is our hope that the National League for Nursing will do and not just know, but follow up on what we know. We will, Barbara, take a stand on what we know needs to be taught to those future nurses that are coming along. We cannot put our heads in the sand. I'm not gonna talk, I'm, I gotta stop. Um, Barbara, you are beloved because I consider you a Cassandra, a, a prophetess, or, but a warrior prophetess. I mean, it's not like the gentle, kind prophetess. I just <laughs> Can we give our speaker another round of applause? Well, with that, colleagues, uh, let me say thank you, as always, to our NLN chair, my colleague and partner in crime, Dr. Kathleen Poindexter, uh, and I thank you. And now I have a, and my board of governors who are sitting on the front row in several, uh, this front row over here, and if you need to, to talk with them or grab them and tell them how much you want to be a part of the NLN and, and of course that you want to make a donation. I don't want to leave that out. <laughs> We're ready to conclude this important opening session. So I have a few announcements. Last week you were emailed a Navigating the Summit informational packet. The packet contained a lot of helpful information Perhaps mostly, most importantly, information about how to receive your CEUs. It's one of those things that you don't need it until you need it. 
So it's important for you to think about it now in case you need it later. As you should have already experienced, you must scan your badge prior, that means before, right? <laughs> Entering each and every session, there's no forgiveness here, colleagues. It's not like, I forgot to, no, no. You will not be able to scan your badge. That's why they had me to do this announcement. It's like, oh, you gotta get up there and tell them the truth. Uh, you will not be able to scan your badge at the conclusion of the session. Whether you beg, cry, plead, offer donuts, no, no. You will not be able to scan your badge. So you have to do it prior to entering the session. And then you get to do it as you leave the session. Your CEU evaluation will be tied to the sessions for which you scanned yourself in. And this includes the general sessions. It's not just the concurrent ones. We have to have some way to verify that you actually completed the work. You will receive an email following the summit with a link to complete your online evaluation and download your certificate. Also, if you haven't already done so, please download the NLN Summit mobile app. Just search for NLN Summit, and this is not a commercial, in the App Store or Google Play. It is not a commercial. With the app, you can stay up to date with the latest announcements, find your way around the summit schedule, and engage with other attendees through the activity feed. Colleagues, none of this could have occurred, and I'm talking about this coming together of us, without the excellent work of our NLN staff, led by Mike Tristick. So, when you see them, whenever you see an NLN staff member, smile and say thank you. Just, and if you can't say thank you, just smile anyway. <laughs> the NLN, we're already getting ready to start planning for next year's, you know, right on. The NLN 2023 Education Summit, celebrating our 130th anniversary, will be, yeah, I mean, I'm getting old, will be held on September 28th through 30th, 2023 at the Gaylord Resort at National Harbor near Washington, D.C. The theme is Extraordinary Nurse Educators Leading in Extraordinary Times. So it's going to be a, a quite an event. Information about abstracts will be on the website next week. You can start making plans now. Colleagues, it is important to remember that you are valued members of the NLN community, family, and we want you to have a marvelous summit experience. And now it's time for the opening reception, exhibits, and posters, I know I will see you there. Thank you for a wonderful opening.